and uh, welcome everyone. I consider this an honor to have the privilege of uh, being the chair of this session and I am uh, grateful to North American Zoroastrian Congress for that. Earlier today, we heard from both Parisa and uh, from Zane. Very eloquently, they touched one of the most fundamental principles of our religion, mainly good deeds, give away, and helping others. I would like to follow up on their lead and uh, perhaps elaborate and expand a little bit on it. So I humbly propose this question, give away or uh, philanthropic investment, or maybe a mix of the two. One may recall the great uh, Chinese philosopher Confucius, give a fish to a hungry man and he comes back hungry every night asking for another fish. Teach him, teach him how to fish and he's gonna be in debt to you for the rest of his life. Personal recognition or public benefits? One may also recall our own prophet Zarathustra. His words have passed the test of time and are applicable to 21st century as they were almost 4,000 years ago. Do the right thing for the sake of righteousness. Do good for the sake of goodness without any expectation of rewards from anybody. This session is about an institution and the visionary person who created that institution. Dr. Fari Borza Masi, science degree PhD graduate of MIT and the pioneers in MEMS microelectromechanical system, which is a branch of nanotechnology. It has been his institution that relatively in a short amount of time has surpassed many expectations in philanthropic investment, charity works. Beyond any kind of religious belief, race, color, ethnicity, and background. My hope or uh, maybe goal is if today can create a spark, if today can plant a seed in the hearts and minds of some of you young Zoroastrians, the youth which are our future, that hopefully one day in a few years you will become another Faribor Zemasi. In the interest of time, I have uh, just a brief sample of some of the philanthropic investment that Masih Institution has done. Let me start, though, by quoting a few statements from the great minds of a few pioneers. A business that makes nothing but money is a poor business, Henry Ford. Doing good does not excuse us from doing better. That's by Howard Buffet, the son of the legendary Warren Buffet. Concentrate your energies your thoughts and your capital, and this is very interesting, 
this Kantarian theory, the wise man puts all his eggs in one basket and watches the basket by the great philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. And the last one from Stephen Jobs, technology is nothing. What's important is that you have a faith in people, that they are basically good and smart, and if you give them tools, they will do wonderful things with them. So in the world of philanthropic investment, as I mentioned, in an intercultural and above and beyond any ethnic and religious boundaries, following is just a small sample of good deeds of massive foundations. Founder of Kids Institute for Development and Advancement, KIDA, an Irvine, California treatment clinic and education facility for autistic, autistic children, perhaps the most advanced in US. And then the Masih Chapel at Hoke Hospital. And then California Zoroastrian Center scholarships. An idea that was offered and initiated by Dr. Massey himself. He came to California Zoroastrian Center and volunteered to provide for the uh, most eligible, qualified, um, good students at the college level. And his fund was matched later on by the good offices of World's Rastian Organization and California's Rastian Center for a total of $60,000 for 12 students, each paid $5,000, which we are so proud of it. That was my first contact with Dr. Massey a few years back. For more details, you can just simply do a net search or go to Wikipedia and look at Fari Gwaza Masih. In the world of academia, Dr. Masih philanthropic investment and contributions for the advancement of arts, science, and technology include, and like I said, and I repeat myself, I apologize, there are a long list. And uh, it was a challenge for me and for staff of Dr. Massey to kind of be able to pick or squeeze, even though Dr. Massey himself cut a lot out of it. Just a few example. At MIT, Massey Hall. Massey Hall in 2010, the Massey Foundation donated $24 million to expand the undergraduate student body. And then Massey Chair in Emerging Technologies. That was in 2003 a prestigious position which was previously held by MIT's provost. At Portland State University, Massey College of Engineering and Computer Sciences, and then also Faribor's Massey Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Both of them were the very first schools in US history to be named after an Iranian American. After the success of this category of philanthropic investment by Dr. Massey, several other philanthropists rep replicated the same model, such as Paul Meiraj School of Business at UCI, University of California at Irvine. And talking about University of California at Irvine, Samuel Jordan Center for Persian Studies this is the very first independent campus center in the United States for Persian studies and culture, and the very first which was created by the private investment of a philanthropic organization, the Massey Foundation. And Howard Baskerville, professor of Persian history, School of Humanities and also Al Bors Auditorium. Al Bors, the name of the uh, most prestigious high school. Of course, there is a debate between Al Bors and Hadaf, so, <laughs> depending on which one you graduated. 
Albors was always number one. Um, and that is the prestigious high school in Tehran that Dr. Massey created an auditorium funded fully at the University of California, Irvine, and named it after his high school, Albors Auditorium. And number four I have in my small list uh, of samples, Rollstone Hall and McCormick Theater. This is Dr. Massey, funded and created and named them after A.A. Rollstone and Nettie Fowler McCormick, the main benefactors to the creation of Albors High School. Talking about commitment and loyalty. And finally, at the University of Southern California, USC Massey Entrepreneurship Prize Competition. Dr. Massey, among other things, is a member of the corporation at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's known as corporation. Member of the Board of Fellows of Harvard Medical School. Executive member of California Council on Science and Technology. Trustee of the Foundation at University of California at Irvine. And the last partial list of his honors and awards as I said, too many to squeeze in my time, but just a few. Include 2006 recipient of Ellis Island Medal of Honor. 2009 Simon Benson Award. That's Portland State University's highest honor in recognition as one of the region's contemporary pioneers of philanthropy. 2009 University of California at Irvine's Medal. This is the most prestigious honor at UCI again. This is for exceptional contributions to the university's mission of teaching, research, and public service. And 2011, the University of Texas at Austin, Distinguished Engineering Graduate Award, Cockrell School of Engineers, Most Prestigious Alumni Award. In 2013, University of Southern California, Viterbi Award. Let me finish by a quote from the great man that I adore personally, John Templeton. An attitude of gratitude creates blessings. Help yourself by helping others. You have the most powerful weapons on earth, love and prayer. Please join me for the honor of having Dr. Fari Borzomasi on stage. We're sharing glasses. I broke my glass in half this morning. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this overly generous introduction. I uh, mentioned to Khosrow that I want this to be two or three minutes. I don't know if we have any time left for me to talk, <laughs> but I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm not Zoroastrian. I guess my ancestors were not courageous enough to withstand the religious persecutions in Iran. So, but I'm very proud to be amongst this cloud today. You carry, my opinion, uh, the purest of the genes of our ancestors. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm asked to talk about philanthropy and um, And so the, the way that I'm going to do this talk is first I talk about some definitions and then I talk about some samples of what we've done, a um, list of which has already been mentioned by Khosrow. And then I talk about what I personally admire as far as philanthropy is concerned. Uh, philanthropy of giving um, means giving your money or resources but it can also mean giving of your time, volunteering. It also can mean giving of your life. And some people have done that. It's mostly motivated by 
certain amount of affinity towards a cause, some recognition, some influence that you like to garner, sometimes retaliation, and finally, um, what I call the puristic one, uh, for the lack of better words. As I mentioned, uh, on the affinity, most of us are involved in certain amount of faith, religious involvement. Some of us love our country, our homeland. Some of us love certain amount of values. So we usually give to those. Most of us are very narcissistic, so we like to be recognized. So we give what I call for tombstones. Uh, you know, you put your name on buildings and plaques and you know, this and that. Um, some of us are motivated by religious uh, or by, by certain amount of social or political beliefs and you like to make choice, uh, changes or bring about changes to the world. So we give to those causes. Those are called philanthropy as well. Sometimes we don't have anybody to give to. Uh, we may not have any heirs, or we may hate our heirs. Uh, we may not, might not like our children or grandchildren. Uh, so, uh, or sometimes we give it uh, uh, to um, an organization so that they are empowered against another one that is called retaliation. And then as I mentioned, uh, we have this uh, puristic. Uh, so what is giving money? Um, if you have too much resources, why not giving it some of it at least to other people that don't have those resources. This is some self-imposed Robin Hoodism. And uh, the question is, well, what is an individual's you know, responsibility to give money to others? Isn't that why we set up governments and you know, are paying taxes? That is true, though mostly governments will become inefficient, ineffective, and uh, people can bring about changes uh, in a much more concentrated way. And that is why public philanthropy, uh, which is by government, is not as effective most of the time than private philanthropy. Giving of your time is equally valuable. Um, some of us volunteer for different causes, those uh, that basically roll their sleeves up and get into the trenches and the causes that they do the real work. I think those are the main heroes. And then there are some of us that uh, enjoy sitting at tables and, you know, um, do chit-chats amongst board of directors and all that uh, to uh, talk about strategy. And uh, uh, both of them are needed uh, to create a good cause and move the needle forward. One of the ultimate ways that you can give is to give the gift of your life. Whether you are a monk or you are an astronaut for the betterment of the science and you go into a space shuttle and it blows up, or you fight for your country, or you fight against invaders, uh, those are all philanthropic ways that you can participate in. But today I'm talking about Persian, oh, I mean, uh, venture philanthropy. So why are we calling it venture philanthropy? It's because it is more of an active philanthropy, active giving, rather than basically giving money or donating 
to a university or to an institution. What we look for is the right cause which has a transformational and abundant impact on the society. And those are very, very hard to find, by the way. Uh, so to, to give money away, it's not as simple as we thought it would be. To find the right cause that has transformational impact is, is really as hard as finding the right business to invest in. We look for competent managers when you give your hard-earned earned money to the hands of the institutions, you want them to be good stewards of your money or resources. So uh, having the right people handling your uh, investments uh, is as crucial as having the right people handling your business affairs. And then we are looking for large impacts, large transformational impacts. And for that, sometimes we actually get involved uh, in the universities or in the institutions or in the hospitals uh, to sit on their boards or uh, be part of their advisory panels. We also want to make sure that we are not the only investor in that cause. We usually want to be the final or the catalyst investor, not the driving force of investment. We want to basically come in at places without, without which would not have been possible, but we give them the final push. Uh, most of the causes that we are involved in, uh, we have been leveraged several times uh, by the time that we come in uh, to make that final push. So these are some of the examples of uh, what we've done. A gift to MIT to expand undergraduate population by 250. They lacked dormitory space, and then they were stuck in the economic downturn at the time. We committed to provide the funds so that they can finish the dorm. In return, they promised to us that they increased the size of the undergraduates by 250 people. Why does that make good business sense? Because over the 10 years, MIT will graduate 1,000 more graduates. 1,000 more individuals will receive an MIT degree. And that economic impact could be in billions of dollars. So the modest investment that we've done though it sounds like a large investment for a private individual, from a society return standpoint, uh, is, is, is very, very modest. The next example is in 2004, we gave some money to Portland State University to merge all of their engineering departments under the same roof. So they can build a large facility, mostly funded by state bonds that was already provided, but they needed matching. We provided the matching found funds and then helped them to raise additional funds, and then they were able to erect a very large building and a very large facility and merge all of their departments together. And where was the benefit for that? Now they have the largest and most recognized engineering school in Portland metropolitan area. It's the only school in Oregon now that has two members of National Academy in it. And it has one of the best computer science departments on the West Coast. The last example is the example of Jordan Center for Persian Studies. After the fall of the regime in Iran, most of the Persian study programs were either dismantled or they were on the verge of closure. It was not very popular to be studying Iranian studies or Persian studies for a long time. Many of the scholars were either retired 
and the universities uh, were no, having, have no plans uh, to renew their uh, uh, basically tenure positions. In 2005, we created the first privately funded center for Persian studies at UCI. It was named after Samuel Martin Jordan, who I will talk about that uh, a little bit later. We also made sure that this center was not under any Middle Eastern or Islamic umbrella. To my knowledge, it is even today the only independent center for Persian studies not affiliated with any Islamic studies program outside of Iran. And where is the benefit for that? Our diaspora population is here to stay and they are part and parcel of the fabric of the United States. Our children can have a place to look into for information and resources about their her heritage. I'm also very happy that the gift has motivated other philanthropists in other universities and other towns to create other Persian study programs at other universities and now we have a much stronger network of Persian study programs throughout the United States. But now I want to talk about who we admire and what we admire. And we call that philanthropy of life. Dedicating all of your time to a cause, whether religious or because of righteousness. Let me give you some Persianite examples of that. First, I'd like to say a few words about a young man who died for constitutional freedom of Iran when he was only 24 years old. A Princeton University graduate called Howard Baskerville went to Iran to serve as a missionary he was a teacher in Tabriz, one of the northern cities of Iran. He goes to the front line when the students and people were sieged by the king. And he is one of the first ones that dies for Iran's constitutional freedom in the crossfire. <clears throat> what affinity or business does a young educated man from Princeton have to some foreign land thousands of miles away, it's hard to say. What is easy and not hard to see is the huge sacrifice of whatever he had. Next, I want to talk about another missionary, Samuel Martin Jordan. He was the captain of his football team at Lafayette University which means he was very popular probably with women or his peers or his community. That's the picture uh, uh, of him and that's where he is. That's him studying at the Princeton Seminary uh, for his doctoral degree lying on the little bed that they have. He goes to Iran around 1898. This photo shows <coughs> him and his wife Mary en route to Tehran from Hamadan to start their work. Several years later, they start a school called the American School in one of the old gentleman's harems educating young boys. He then expands the school and builds his building and builds this building mostly by fundraising in United States. 
This building was given to Iran as a gift by Mr. Rolston of Oklahoma, who gave a substantial sum of his personal wealth to Jordan to build this uh, biggest building in Albers High School. It's worth noting that Mr. Slorsnon once was one of the most successful oil men in Oklahoma. He dies penniless with his sister in a two-bedroom apartment that they rented in a small Oklahoma town. Ironic that the oil money from Oklahoma funds education in Iran when Iran did not possess any substantial revenue from oil at that time. Rolston Hall is now known as the central building in Albers High School. He was virtually forgotten. We dedicated a Rolston Hall at UCI to conserve his memory. I'd like to close by the last category of philanthropy, which I call puristic, for the lack of better words. When you do not need or ask to be recognized, when no one knows or need to know if you have helped or there is no one to thank, that to me is the ultimate philanthropy which is becoming a lot harder, by the way, nowadays with internet and Google connectivity. So I'm here because I was asked to come and talk about this subject. However, my motivation is that some of you do a lot better than what we've done, as this is the Darwinian way of evolution. And please remember this, that it is not all about money. Thank you again for having me here. If there is any more time left, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you. today and taking your time. Um, it's an honor. My name is Roya Azarkevan. I'm 19 years old and I study at UC Berkeley. And so my question is more of an economic one. What I got from your pres presentation is that you were kind of saying we need to invest our capital into expanding our human capital so that human capital can go forward and give us returns on our investments. And so my question is maybe a little more off topic, but I hope you can relate it. So what I've been noticing in present time where I've been saying is that our financial markets are converging as technology and globalization continues to occur. For example, under one of my professors, just to give you an understanding where I'm coming from, um, I study blockchain technology and how that can be the future of our financial transactions and how that might decentralize the financial market. So my question to you is, what are the implications of the progression of technology and globalization on the future of investment? Do you feel like this form of investment, investing in human capital, will still be possible 50 years from now considering like globalization and technology keeps transforming our economy or do you think we're gonna have to change the way we invest in order to keep up with this technology and globalization? Well, that's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I, um, it's hard to predict how 50 years from now is going to emerge. But what we know in the past 20, 25 years, or if you take the past 50 years, the rate of change is accelerating. We are going through a acceleration of the total change in everything. And most of it has been de delivered by technology, whether it is in finance, medicine, law, consumer, um, 
and interconnectivity, which is everybody is a lot more connected. Uh, I think in the panel before, which was a very exciting panel, uh, people were talking about using the internet uh, to connect to uh, Iranian Zardoshis uh, or, you know, uh, everybody communicates more uh, using technology. I think as we are becoming more and more connected, the boundaries are going to fall. People are going to have better understanding of each other. Forty years ago, it would have been probably uh, uh, less of a um, norm for someone like me to be accepted to come and address a, uh, a religious group. Uh, but it's because of the connectivity that, you know, we are all connected, we know each other, uh, we uh, are basically taking all the walls down. Uh, I think in the future, uh, you will have certain personal beliefs, but the financial markets may become a lot more flat than today. Uh, the information is going to be available to everybody. Um, and it's, 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 it's becoming that one world, one country kind of a thing. If we don't blow each other up, uh, you know, meanwhile, uh, I think we will be going into the right direction. Um, uh, people are going to be different, but are going to be also more of the same. Yeah. See, my uh, question to you is, uh, I've heard about your passion about the pre-Islamic Persia um, and that era. I just want to know if there was a moment that that spark ignited where you became interested. I just want to know why the passion, why the interest, and if there's a story behind it. I think we are genetically geared to want to love where we came from. And I don't think that, you know, where we came from is necessarily Islamic or Christian. Um, I think it's more Persian that I am proud of. Um, I'm proud of you all. Um, I mean, you know, I, I heard that, you know, the, uh, some of the fires that are burning in the tem temples in India have been preserved for hundreds of years. Um, you know, having affinity to your homeland, who you are, uh, I think makes you more strong. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what I uh, am the most proud of. Uh, I, I cannot say that religion has made Iran a better place, per se. So, so I, I'm, I'm not saying pre-Islam or after Islam. There are, there are wonderful people during the Islamic era that have contributed a lot uh, to the Persian society. You have Saadi, you have Ferdowsi, you have Hafez. Uh, I mean, these are the canons of our culture. Uh, and they were all during the Islamic area. Uh, but, but, but I'm mostly interested in the Persian part of it, uh, not the religious part of it. Uh, my name is Roshan uh, Sethna, and I am um, from North Carolina, where I uh, helped start an incubator for social enterprises, and now work in California for a web design firm that mostly focuses on social sector clients. Um, and something that I've discussed with colleagues at both of those organizations is how to determine where we invest our time and money and energy in projects. Um, and I think because of technology, we have this abundant um, opportunity 
Um, but that also, for example, when you're um, trying to determine whether or not to do a project with a drone company, uh, there could be a drone company that is using drones to gather information on people, which could affect privacy issues. But then, then on the other hand, there could be a drone company that's gathering data on agriculture issues and helping rural farmers improve their techniques. Um, so I'm wondering if you and your organization have a way of determining um, what the social impact of um, potential of a project is and whether or not to invest time and money into it um, when the lines are a little bit more blurry than something like education or healthcare where there might be an obvious positive impact. Um, it's, it's a really, really good question. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult one to answer because you can answer any ways and there are arguments on the other side. So the easy pathways are the education and the healthcare. And that's why we traditionally have invested in those, not because of, you know, they were socially better, but it, I think it was more empowering. Um, a person being educated can create not only drones, but many other things during their life. Uh, but if we just concentrate on a product per se, uh, that boxes us uh, in uh, into that one product and one dimension. So uh, uh, I guess being general, um, I mean that, that thing that we've done at MIT, this was uh, just an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, though um, it seems like you know, we gave a lot of money, but, but you know, we, we, we truly felt like you know, we were honored to have been given that opportunity to make a change like that. Uh, so so that's, that's more of a general change. Uh, we don't know any of them is going to do what. Uh, uh, so if your question is, how do you feel about you working in a drone or something? Uh, uh, I think you just uh, need to do your thing um, and um, do good, um, act well. Uh, speak well. Uh, I, I think those are the canons of your religion. Those are the guideposts that are going to guide you no matter what you're going to work on. I think I'm kind of out of time, uh, but is there time for one more question? Yeah, there was encouraging that we see our youth coming forward and asking questions. Hi, Dr. Massey. Um, I'm Shirin Surush. Um, first off, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on phil philanthropic uh, investments. Um, I am a graduate of UC Irvine, and I was able to take one of the Persian Studies courses, as well as um, I'm in my first year of working as a school psychologist, so I've heard a lot about KIDA. Um, thank you for that. Um, I have more of a broad question. I just wanted to get your perspective on um, a takeaway piece of personal advice and a piece of professional advice that you'd give to a new um, professional. Just anything broad. I respect everything you've done, it'd be nice. Oh, I know exactly what to tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what I'm saying is don't listen to me. Uh, listen to yourself. Uh, my perspective, the wise perspective, we are from a different time with different conditions. Uh, what made me successful if that's you want to call it that, um, may not be the same as what will make you successful. So I think you should just listen to yourself, ignore me and folks like me. That's my advice to you. Uh, listen to your heart. Hello, Dr. Massey. I'm Shadan Irani. Um, I have a question. So. How do you encourage people in the world of finance, which um, they're generally characterized by uh, cutthroat individuals, to engage in venture philanthropy? 
and how should we show these people with capital the benefits of investing their capital in a philanthropic, philanthropic manner rather than investing it straight back into the financial market? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if that's a byproduct of being in finance or being in um, agriculture or what your profession is. If, if you feel the responsibility to give back, you will, no matter what profession you're going to be involved in. Like I said, it's not about money. Uh, uh, even if you don't have anything, uh, you can go and volunteer for a cause. Uh, so I, I don't know if it is a byproduct of being in finance, and if you like to study finance, I definitely would keep going, uh, make a lot of money, and give away a lot of money. Uh, so there is no, uh, uh, I, I've seen people that are in very honorable fields, but they don't give away anything. Uh, is. So uh, I think it's just like a personal choice uh, and a moral responsibility. And, um, and I also don't say that, you know, um, people who don't give away are any less valuable than others. Uh, it, it's a personal choice. I'm just saying, showing my personal choices. I'm not passing any good or bad judgment uh, for it. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Masi. With uh, your permission, I would like to invite a young, sweet, intelligent lady to come on stage on behalf of the Masi family. Panda Masi, please. <laughs> Family is the most important, especially in any culture that is successful, including ours. Sweet Pan, the intelligent young lady, is a representative of the Massey family. And on behalf of the North American Zoroastrian Congress, I would like to give her and the family a small token of appreciation. Pan, this is for Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for that.